This is ABC7 Extra. Good evening, I'm Maria Garcia. Welcome to ABC7 Extra. Glad you're joining us. Tomorrow marks a historic day for the El Paso Independent School District. For more than two years, the district has been led by a board of managers appointed by the Texas Education Agency. But tomorrow, for the first time in more than two years, an elected board will oversee and lead the district. As we told you, the Texas Education Agency in December of 2012 dismantled the EPISD board and appointed a board of managers to oversee the district after its former superintendent went to prison for public corruption. Since then, trying to regain the trust of the public and deal with problems locked kicked down the road. The Board of Managers has been busy. But tomorrow, the elected trustees will be sworn in, ushering a new era for EPISD and that new chapter filled with major, politically unpopular challenges. Aging facilities, a declining student population, potential tax hikes to pay for campus restructuring, and paving the path for a better education for our students. We'll be joined by the three most recent people elected by voters who will be sworn in tomorrow. Dory Fennenbach, Trent Hatch, and Alvarade. You can email us your comments and questions now to abc7extra at kvia.com. You can also reach us by phone at 915-496-1775 or tweet me at MariaGABC7 or you can also use the hashtag at ABC7 Extra. Joining us now, Dory Fennenbach, Al Velarde and Trent Hatch. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Uh, so a few weeks ago, several weeks ago actually, uh, Superintendent Juan Cabrera was on this program and, and we talked about how EPISD really is plagued with some problems that were kicked down the road by prior boards uh, because they were just politically unpopular, uh, at least that's, that's the assumption. Uh, no facilities report in more than 15 years, that $12 million shortfall from last year. Um, all issues that there's a consensus the prior board should have and could have dealt with. Dee Margo, too, has been very vocal about how ineffective prior trustees have been. How do you change that? How will you be different? Dory, we'll start with you. Um, you know, I, th I think that the first thing we need to do is, is just um, stay connected to the constituencies. You know, we're fresh off of the campaign trail for the last six weeks where we have uh, spent a, an enormous amount of time connecting with people, listening to their concerns, and bringing that with us into the district. And I think that it's, it's easy sometimes to be disconnected to kind of the pulse of what's happening in the community, and I think we're bringing that with us. Uh, you know, the power that, that trustees have is incredibly staggering, um, and, and you'll have that power tomorrow when you're sworn in. Uh, I mean, you'll help shape uh, the future of tens of thousands of children and their families. Um, you'll set a tax rate. And, and there's this perception that trustees just are not as invested in their job as they should be. Um, and that perception arguably is there for a good reason. I mean, under the prior board, uh, Lorenzo Garcia committed fraud. So how, again, will you be different, Al? Well, you know, one of the reasons why I stepped up to the plate to do this was because of what was occurring. I, I made the decision some time back uh, that we needed to have trustees that were going to come in to do the work for the kids with, with a specific goal, f focus on improving e education and providing that education for our kids and nothing else. And, and you know, it's funny because I was talking to a friend one time and we were just kind of chatting with each other and, and saying, who could that person be? Who could that person be? And finally he said, well, it's got to be you, Al. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> be, and, and, and the reality, and I think we can see with the quality of, of the candidates that went through and, and got elected here, and, and I think I speak for all of us, that we're in this not because of any agendas. We're not trying to get anything for ourselves. We believe in this community. We believe in El Paso. We believe in the districts that we represent. And I got in it for that reason, and I see a great opportunity here to be able to change that course and take it down the road that it really needs to be, and that is focused on our kids. So how specifically, though? 
Well, in my case, well, we're going to connect with our communities, and, and, and the wonderful thing about the, uh, the campaign is, is I was able to do that. I met so many people, so many different groups, alumni associations, groups that support Jefferson, uh, civic groups. I got to know these people, and I talked to them, and they talked to me, and they shared with me everything that's going on, their beliefs, and so forth. And it really came down to a trust issue. And so for district representation to do what it's supposed to do, we've got to be communi communicating with the people who have an interest in, in the in the school district, and obviously everybody has that interest because of the tax that they have to pay, and we need to be communicating and just sharing and being open with them the well, issues I'll, that are uh, taking place. You know, speaking with people, speaking with constituents, going on the campaign trail, I mean, what you're all saying, I mean, it, it sounds essentially like campaign talk. So, mm -hmm. so you're here, you've been elected. Uh, Policy-wise, though, what specifically do you do to move forward? Well, when, when these policies come to us, when these decisions come to the board, we're going to evaluate these decisions based on the best interest of the children, of the teachers, mm -hmm. of the people that are implementing these things. We're not going to be thinking about who's going to get the contract. We're not going to be thinking about who's going to benefit from this or how I'm going to benefit. It's going to be truly about making the best decision uh, based on what's presented to us in order to make this action take place. Trent, okay. um, and so the, the same question for you. How well, do you be, how do you, how are you an invested trustee? Um, I think as I look at uh, my fellow partners here and the four others that have been elected to sit on this board, um, how do I personally look at this? I have children that go to EPISD and so the policies that I'm going to be looking at um, are policies that will help all of our children. Um, that impacts my family as well and so um, how are we invested? Sure, we had to do the campaign thing and that was important because it connected us with the community. But in addition to that, we have our own children who were engaged in the school district and so we've got to do the right thing for our children. Okay, uh, we have a tweet from Jaime. He says, all three have been given huge amounts of money by some of the most wealthy El Pasoans and the TER, the Texas Texans for Education Reform. Will they commit to protecting public education? We'll start with you, Trent. Well, sure, absolutely. We were elected to protect public education. We weren't elected to protect private uh, education. Well, but the 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 T the TER. I mean, a, a lot of people are obviously very very leery of it. Mm -hmm. uh, they they talk about bringing business practices to schools, fewer job protections for children, expanding charter schools, um, and that makes some educators very worried. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have to do what's right for our children who are in public education. We can learn a lot from the private sector, but we also need to protect the public or the public school education system. That's what we're elected to do. We're not elected to turn everything into private. We're elected to, to support and serve our community with the, pub, uh, with the public education system. Al, do you want to respond to that tweet? Sure. The tweet was about the money that was raised. And, and you know, this is very unique election because of what's going on there is a lot of interest taking place the El Paso Independent School District has a big role within this community and the people who wanted to get behind that are people that have an interest in this community as well and they want to see PISD succeed and so they and I'm proud to say they picked me many of them picked me to, to help me with my campaign because they believe that I am the right person to be able to do the, do what they're expecting of a board. Uh, and, and so, and I heard this all along the way, and it's nothing about buying off candidates. It's about interested people who have a huge stake in this community, that, that have a future in this community, and they want to see the children educated in the school district that's not going to be going through the issues that it's been facing over the past several years. But a group like, like TER does have an, an agenda, though. Um, I mean, some people say the, it's, it's a great agenda. Some people say it's not a great agenda. It's a bad agenda. So, I mean, there, there, there is an, ag an agenda to, to some of uh, the groups, for example, the TER, that, that committed money to your campaign. So the question is, are you beholden to their, to their interest story? Well, you know, I had over 200 supporters in my campaign, and so it's just difficult to say I'm going to be beholden to every one of them. Um, and I, I agree with Al that... Um, that these are people that care very much about the, the progress of our city and of our community. And, um, and, and we are here to advocate for public education. I have two sons in uh, Coronado High School. Trent has his kids in, in the public education here. This is where our passion is, and that was what we're, what we're here to, to advocate for, and that's what we're going to do. Okay. Uh, specifically, uh, do you support charter school expansion? I'll go on that one. Um, I, you know, charter schools, 
it, it seems like it's kind of the buzzword coming out of Austin now. They're wanting to see that. I, you know, I, I can't say that options are a bad thing. But the truth is, with respect to a public school, it's not a good thing. Because for every child that moves from the public school over to the charter school, that child goes and so does the funding for that child. So then the challenge for the school district is to find a way to be able to provide that education so that EPISD is the school of choice. So that there is not a need for additional charter schools to come into this community to address things that EPISD, EPISD is not already doing. So options are good, but the reality is they don't help public schools just simply because the funding shifts from one one school to the charter school. And then, of course, we have to face that when it comes to budgets. Uh, now, for, for taxpayers and for parents, I wonder, uh, who have children at EPISD and who say, hey, I'm a taxpayer. Um, I pay my property taxes to EPISD uh, every year, and um, I looked around at the public schools, and I want my child to go to a charter school. Uh, and if I'm a tax-paying citizen, why can't I choose to do that? I, I think what Al talked about is that EPISD needs to be the, the, the district of choice. And we as a board working with um, Mr. Cabrera, Superintendent Cabrera, and the other uh, administrators in the school district, we need to provide an opportunity for every parent to have their child educated at EPISD. We cannot afford to continue to lose students. It impacts our budget. It impacts the way we educate our children. So we've got to work uh, uh, together. We've got to work efficiently and effectively to make sure that we're not going to lose those students to a charter school because we are, we, we were elected to represent the public school education. Okay, Dory? I agree that, um, you, you know, I think in, in just a general sense, uh, choice kind of makes you focus and um, it, you have to become more competitive. And so because there are existing charters in our community, um, we have to work to make EPISD the, the school of choice for our, for our families. And I think it is, and I think it will continue to be. And in fact, I think it's just going to continue to get better. And that's what we're focused on, is building opportunities for our children. And um, I, I think that there's too much being made about whether we go left or right. It's, you know, let's, let's be proactive and let's figure out about you know, what programming is relevant, what um, careers uh, are, are going to help our children in this com community, uh, opportunities to bring our children back to El Paso. That's what we're focused on. And, um, and, and we have 92 schools in which to do that. Okay, we have to take a commercial break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the budget coming up, your, your first task there. Uh, we're also going to talk about facilities and, and aging, aging facilities, so stay with us. Uh, remember, you can call us at 915-496-1775, uh, email us at abc7xjkva.com, or you can tweet me at Maria G abc 7 We'll be right back. Welcome back to ABC 7 Extra. We're talking to the three most recent elected EPISD trustees. Uh, let's get to some of our tweets. Eduardo tweets, EPISD can begin to be the district of choice if it makes dual language universal to students at all levels, pre-K through 12th grade. Uh, another tweet from Eduardo, some in the private sector are only interested in minimizing costs regardless of the effects on the learning of children. And from JD, as a taxpayer, what are you doing to win my heart and mind to regain trust in EPISD? Uh, anybody want to answer that question? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, it, first of all, you know, we weren't just speaking campaign rhetoric. I mean, we mean it sincerely that we spent a tremendous amount of time um, listening to people, talking to people, wanting to understand <coughs> what their concerns are and how we can help address them. Mm -hmm. So so that's how I think we, we, we rebuild trust, is that sincerity of being connected to our community. Um, and regarding dual language, I couldn't agree more that we have a geographical advantage here in El Paso, and every child should be graduating fluent in English and fluent in Spanish. And that's an advantage. It's a necessity here in El Paso, but it's going to be an, an, a leg up for these kids anywhere, anywhere where they go and I think we're already committed to it right. and, and I think we certainly would would uh, be committed to seeing it forward okay uh, let's talk about the budget uh, has to be approved uh, by the end of June the tax rate as well do you foresee going to the voters for an increase we'll start with you Trent 
Um, right now, it's uh, really early to say what we're going to be able to do or not. We haven't even been sworn in, and so we're, we're kind of uh, speculating what we will do as a board. Uh, what we're, what we're going to need to do is to gather the data and gather the facts that the, the district will provide to us and work closely with the other four trustees who have been elected just as we have been. And we need to really crunch those numbers, look and see the impact of where those dollars are being spent, how we're spending them. Our commitment is to not increase uh, taxes. Um, I know that was something that I heard regularly on the campaign, please, please do not increase my taxes. We're all taxpayers. We're not exempt from paying taxes. So any policy that we put into play impacts us personally. So we're definitely going to look at these items. We're going to definitely look at the tax rate. We're going to look at the budget. And we're going to be methodical. And we're not going to make rash decisions immediately. We'll need to look at that. We don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, to do this. But we'll take the data that's going to be provided to us, ask a lot of questions, and then uh, make decisions that, that, that we feel is best for the community and our students. What do you foresee on the budget, Al? Well, again, it's the same. It's really too early for us to be able to predict what's going to happen with the outcome of, of, of the tax rate uh, uh, that gets set. At, at this point, really, what's happening is, is we're getting some training on this budget. They're, they're presenting us the, the figures. Uh, we're, we're going through and, and we're asking questions. And, and we're going line by line by line and, and we're asking, what is this for? Why is it needed? And, and we're talking about a $460 million budget, so there's a lot of questions to be asked. There's still more training to go on. So I couldn't even begin to tell you where we're going to be at, at the end of June when it comes time to decide uh, how we're going to move forward with this budget. It's a massive budget, uh, but we do have a learning curve to go through, and that's what we're doing right now. We have a tweet from Jaime. He writes, uh, EP's largest district only has one Latino member. Do they honestly feel they reflect El Paso? It takes more than speaking Spanish. C can, I, uh, can I address that? <laughs> sure. So um, I was born and raised in Mexico, lived there for 18 years. So one thing that I've really enjoyed doing on the campaign trail, let's say, was to really engage with the Hispanics of El Paso because I am one as well. I'm always learned you don't judge the book by its cover. And so that's really how I truly feel. I, uh, have, uh, I, I know um, how the people feel. And so we don't have just one Hispanic on the board. That's, that's not correct. We have uh, two at least. And, uh, but that's not going to shape the way we think. We're going to do a try for the community. We're going to do a try for the all kids in the in the in the students in the school district, and so yeah, I appreciate that that uh, question, but it's not it's not accurate. Uh, you know, you you all obviously were were given a directive by voters who chose you, who elected you, uh, but. 80, an 80% 80 Hispanic community, um, two Hispanic people on the board. You could say that's a legitimate question. Do you reflect uh, El Paso? Well, I, I ran against three Hispanics and was successful by uh, a, a quite a wide margin. And so I think this community um, it, you know, understands the candidates and selects the candidate they think is best for the job. It's not about, um, you know, not, it doesn't have to be a, a down ethnic lines. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really good model for us to think about, that mm -hmm. um, th this is not because, you know, who you are, where you're born, doesn't mean that you, you know, can't be compassionate and care about the entire community. So I would really encourage us to change that narrative in our community. And we are in this together. We, we you know, a rising tide raises all boats. And this is our community in El Paso. We, we live here. This is our home. We all want it to succeed. Okay. Uh, the Board of Managers spent a lot of time leaving a blueprint uh, so that you all won't have half empty schools in a, in a few years, but ultimately uh, the decision is up to you. Uh, I know you worked on the facilities plan, Dory. Uh, what, do you, what are your general thoughts on that? Are you, do you plan to tweak it? If so, what specifically will you tweak? Uh, we can start with you, Dory. Well, the, um, I, I have studied the Jacobs Engineering Report, and I know it very well, and it is clear that our facilities are in dire need of some capital infusion. Um, the problem is we don't have the capital, uh, and I don't see uh, an avenue to uh, having access to capital on the, in the near horizon. Um, I think that that's something that we need to um, address in terms of uh, within the budget, and um, and, and then. Um, educate our community about the condition of our facilities, where we want to move our, uh, our programming and our technology in our classrooms, and how our children are going to ultimately benefit by doing it. Uh, and then come up with the right package that is going to make sense for the community. 
Okay, and that blueprint, I should say, would uh, leave EPISD's 10 high schools intact, would reduce the number of middle schools from 15 to 9, and increase uh, K through 8 campuses. Uh, do you agree generally with that, with that plan, uh, Al, or do you plan to tweak it? Generally, I do agree with it. I think the plan <coughs> is prepared fairly well. Uh, but obvious, obviously, we have not been a part of the development of that plan, and, and I think it's going to be important that we go back and take a look at everything that's within that plan to make sure that it is the absolute necessary uh, project that needs to go forth in order to make the, the plan. So am I willing to say that today? I'm willing to say, well, let's go with that plan. No, I think we've got to do a lot of work on it. We're going to take a look at it, and if changes need to be made, we're going to make those changes. I have no problem with that. Trent? I agree with that. Everything needs to be put back on the table. It needs to be analyzed, reviewed within a timely manner so that we make the right decision for the future of El Paso. Uh, we're in this position because of decisions that were made 15 years ago. Um, we need to be able to put ourselves in a better position for the future, for our children, for our uh, teachers, for our administrators, for central office, for everybody. We've really got to look long term. So obviously some school closures still an option. How do you ensure that children whose school closes end up in a better situation? whether it be a better campus or um, a campus with more opportunities, with more programs. How do you ensure that? I'd like to answer that one. I, I think part of what I'm going to look at in this plan, and I think the plan does spell it out pretty good, is we're not going to close one school just to move a bunch of kids over to another to fill up a, another old school. If we're going to do a consolidation, it's going to be because one of those schools is going to be completely rebuilt, completely remodernized, and those children that go from the school that's going to be closing are going to go and join other kids in a much newer 20 first century school with all the latest amenities, uh, learning amenities uh, that are provided. That's going to be my one golden rule and I think that I can speak for many others on that too. It's not about just the shifting kids from one old school to another. It's going to be providing better facilities, improved education for our kids. That really is going to be the goal of the entire project so that all kids have access to improved education. Okay, so Dory, do you want to answer the question, how do you ensure that a child gets uh, better opportunities if their school is closed? Well, I, um, when I was involved with the facility planning, um, I had never heard of K-8 or didn't understand the, the the um, evolution of why we don't have K-8s now. Uh, and I just Googled it and did my own research. And I invite anybody else to, to go do that for themselves. Because you find that there's been an incredible amount of research put into that. And um, there are many benefits of a K-8. You know, greater parental engagement in the middle, middle years. Um, you have a sixth grade academic decline across the board when you have a sixth through eighth grade, eighth grade program. Um, that transition creates a lot of anxiety for kids. So, th so that tends to be eliminated. So, th so those are just a couple of examples of, um, of, of why that particular reconfiguration, I, th I think, makes sense. Um, technology. You know, if you look at Coronado High School in my district, it's been built out of cinder blocks. You know, that's, it's a terrible uh, way to try to conduct Wi-Fi throughout your, your high school. So, you know, we have access to an incredible amount of information now through the Internet. And our schools are a great opportunity for us to address the digital divide of families who have access to the Internet and families who don't. Because in our schools, we can create a portal where everybody does. And that is um, where you can learn and engage in a 21st century way. So we have to create a learning environment that's going to allow that to happen. Okay, we have to take a break. When we come back, we're going to take more of your tweets and questions. So stay with us. Remember, you can uh, call us at 496-1775 or you can tweet me at Maria GABC7. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to ABC7 Extra. Let's go to our phone lines. We have Jesus from the west side. Hi, Jesus. What's your comment or your question? I just want to find out uh, what they're going to do about uh, reducing central office administration. Uh, I feel it's too top heavy there. And also, uh, what are we going to do about uh, enforcing uh, student accountability as far as uh, discipline and uh, academics? Thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, so his first question, reducing central office personnel. Well, that's going to fall within the budget as, uh, as well. Those are things that are going to have to be looked at. I know that last year that they did reduce significantly uh, within central office, so the question remains, can you continue to cut within there uh, without hampering uh, the organization and the operation of that? But obviously everything's going to be on the table, and, and if cuts have to be made, you know, that's one place that we're going to have to look. Dory Trent, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, I, I'm a big uh, believer that our people are our best assets at EPISD, and uh, particularly the teachers. You know, that there's research that shows that um, children who have access to one great teacher, ha it has tremendous benefits throughout their life. I mean, reduced crime, higher education, better earning capacity over their life. And so, um, so we have to support, retain, and attract the best teachers. Um, and so we have to uh, just prioritize teachers, um, technology and programming and and then the rest we'll just have to figure out how to make it work. Trent? I agree with that. We need to create an environment where um, we attract the best talent. Um, the, 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 we're educating our children and I think that that's sometimes that's forgotten and so we need the best teachers, we need the best administrators, we need a central office and a, and a, and a group of individuals there who will support that cause because ultimately we're educating children and so we have to look at everything. Um, uh, Al mentioned that we have to, that's within the budget and so it's really important that we ha might have to make some tough decisions. They're not so much us but uh, Superintendent Cabrera and his staff are going to have to really take a look at how we're, uh, if we're lean or not. Um, we can't be top heavy. We have to be lean. We've got to be efficient and effective uh, and to, to ensure that we're able to operate on a, a budget that uh, can help us accomplish our goals. Uh, Jesus on the West Side also mentioned uh, student accountability. How do you increase that? Well, student accountability can be interpreted in many different ways. Um, I'm not really sure what he's looking for, but our students need to be accountable. Um, they've got to take their education serious. And how do they do that? First of all, they've got, they have to understand how, um, why it's important to be educated and understand that if they are educated, later on they can attend college. And if they, are, uh, if they want to continue down that path for college education, they have the ability to grow and earn more in their life. And so that accountability is on the student. But we, I think we as adults, uh, the community, teachers, administration, we can encourage that and be real supportive of our students to know that there's a greater education other than just high school diplomas. Okay, uh, let's go to our next caller. We have Rick from Central. Hi, Rick. What's your comment or your question? This question is for Ms. Fennenbach. Um, when you were running, you promised your constituents in your area that there was going to have to be cutbacks. And the cutbacks would not start with, with students, you know, teachers first, but it would start with administrators. I would like to find out what day are you looking to look, start looking at those positions administrative level and uh, and what departments in the administration. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't recall saying that uh, that we were going to cut administrators. So I think what I did say is that um, we are going to prior prioritize teachers, and we're going to prioritize um, technology, and we're going to pro prioritize programming. Um, I do think that if we're losing a thousand students a year, um, that we're going to have to downsize, and and I think that we need to downsize at central office. Uh, I, I have said that consistently. Um, but that being said. Uh, we are just now really getting a detailed line by item look at the budget and uh, we're looking at it extremely carefully to find out where the non-essential um, resources are being allocated and that's where we need to, to focus. We're looking at um, continued deficits. We don't know what's going to happen with the um, the potential for added state funding and we're not probably going to know that until after we have to pass the budget. So we're going to have to come in extremely conservative uh, and I'm committed to um, making the cuts as necessary so that we are running a very efficient um, uh, organization and that, that we continue to prioritize our resources where they directly impact our, our kids. Okay, a uh, few tweets. Joaquin, I'm very confident in Mr. Hatch's decision making. His morale is beyond reproach and will do what's best for our kids in EPISD. Eduardo tweets, the best 21st century learning amenity for students is a well-prepared, well-supported, and accountable teacher. Too many students fall through the cracks with big schools. We need smaller schools so that students get more individual attention. And also trustees must be prepared to question the data that's presented by administrators and seek input from parents and teachers. So uh, a, lot, a lot of tweets coming in about engagement from trustees, seeking input, questioning data. I think that's super important. Um, as, as I've been a parent uh, of, of, I am a parent of three children, and they are, they all attend EPISD schools, and we have found a great deal of information as we have been engaged in our students and our children's education. We need to ask a lot of questions. We need the community in t in the school in these schools. Th these these are our children. These are our schools. We pay for this, and so we invite every parent. 
uh, a very reasonable parent to be engaged. Um, that's what we need because that's the way it takes a village to raise uh, our students, not just one person. And, and it, it really, truly does take a village. So that I'm, I'm a big, big uh, proponent of, of having community involvement, community engagement, and the more parents are involved in their children's education, the more successful those students will be in the future in their lives. Okay. Uh, last question. Who should be board president? I mean, I mean, really, gener generally, uh, the board looks to somebody with experience uh, to, to be the board president. Uh, but all of you are new to the job, so it's 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 a very unique situation. What do you think? I think there are several individuals on this board who are going to be fully capable uh, of being able to take that position. Uh, I, I have every confidence in the world that the president that's going to be selected tomorrow is going to be fully supported by the board. Uh, I think at this gauge, until tomorrow, uh, I, I don't know that would be right to be able to go beyond that. Uh, but I, I, the wonderful thing about uh, this board that's in place is there's some very good people with some strong backgrounds that will be able to fulfill all of the officer seats that are available. Okay. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for, jo for joining us. I know it's past your bedtime for some of you, so we appreciate it. <laughs> Tomorrow's Thank a big you day. So much, Jerry. Thank you so much, Thank you. and Thank we'll see you. you tomorrow at the swearing-in. This has been ABC7 Extra. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.